Hello, Year 6. Um, we're on to Session 3 already. Uh, it's going really, really quickly this week. So we are still reading um, The Girl Who Speaks Bear, and we are now going to read Chapter 2 and then do the second part of the activity that or the learning that we were going to do yesterday. But we're going to continue it today as well. OK, so I'm just going to share my screen with you. And I hope that you are all really enjoying the text that we're reading at the moment. I know we are. So today's the 13th of January um, and we're doing reading session three. So The Girl Who Speaks Bear by Sophie Anderson. And we're going on to chapter two, Anatoly. So Anatoly arrives at night with ice in his beard and moonlit eyes. Excitement bubbles inside me as I watch him through the frost coated window. He unharnesses and feeds his sledge dogs, brushes each of them carefully, checks their paws and whispers their names. Nessa, Bayen, Pieto and Zoya. Finally, he settles them into the shelter and comes inside. He ducks through the doorway, huge as a bear, in his deer skins and furs. But once he peels off his layers and sits by the fire in his threadbare rubaca tunic, he looks thinner and older than I remember. There are deeper wrinkles around his silvery eyes and more white hairs in his lopsided beard, which doesn't grow evenly because of the burn scars on his cheeks. But his smile is the same. He looks down when he smiles and flushes pink at his bullfinch's belly. It's been two months since Anatoly last visited, and though that feels like forever, it's not that long. Sometimes there's half a year or more between his visits. Other times, a few weeks. I wish he visited more regularly. I miss him when he's not here and spend too much time wondering when he'll come. Anatoly lives alone in the forest, hunting, fishing and trapping animals to survive. No one in the village knew he existed until about 10 years ago when he turned up at Momochi's doorstep asking for an ointment to soothe his burns. They were old scars from a forest fire years before, but he said they still ached and itched at night. Since then, Anatoly had visited at least once a year and often many more times. Occasionally, he stays for a night, sleeping by our fire, and people in the village tease Momochi and says he's, he's her, her sweetheart. She just laughs and says you can't, can't have a sweetheart who spends all their time hiding in the forest. But her eyes shine brighter and her smile spreads wider when he visits. You look like you haven't eaten since we last saw you, Momochi pours Anatoly a cup of tea with lemon and passes him a basket of Priyanka, soft spice cookies with a glaze of white as snow outside. Momochi is small, half the size of either Anatoly or me, but she takes up more space. She bustles around, strong and unstoppable, filling the room with as much movement and life as a flight of doves. Anatoly sips his tea, bites a Priyanik, and colour floods into his face. I've eaten well, but I've been in the far north these last months and the cold makes me thin. What did you find? I asked, tingling with anticipation for the story. When Anatoly comes out of the snow forest, there's always a story. When I was young, I believed all of Anatoly's tales, whether they were about wolf packs hunting over moonlit snow or fire dragons leaping from volcanoes. Because his stories came from the forest, like me, they felt like clues to my past. Now I know Anatoly's stories are just stories. Mamochi has told me often enough. But still, I like to believe them in the moments when he tells them, and sometimes afterwards in the depth of night, when the branches outside my window shine silver, and I can't sleep for thinking about what secrets the forest holds. Anatoly smiles his shy smile, reaches deep into his pocket and pulls out his map. He smooths the tattered old paper over the low table between us and I search for the new mark. There's always a new mark, hidden somewhere amongst the inky trees to show where the story begins. Here is the village. Anatoly points to the neat drawing of the village on the southern end edge of the map. And here is your house. His finger hovers over mine and Mamochi's house, which is marked by two small hearts inside a square. Anatoly always points out all of the features on his map, even though I've seen it so many times I could draw it from memory. But I don't mind. I like listening to his gentle voice rumble against the crackling of the fire, and I like watching his callous fingers skate through the sketch forest. It also gives me a chance to find the new mark on my own. 
The mark might be a large feature, like the picture of a, picture of a crumbling castle that p appeared last year to go with a story about a bear who had once been human. Or it might be a small feature, like the claw hidden in a glade that sparked a story about how a lone baby girl stood up to a pack of wolves. Anna Tony told me that story when I was very young, and I still have the wolf claw he gave me under my pillow. Sometimes running my finger along it makes me feel brave, but at other times the sight of the thick, dark hook as long as my thumb makes me pull my blankets tight around me. My gaze drifts across the, across the map, north through the forest along a narrow winding trail. Creatures hide among the trees, wolves and wolverines, badgers and bears, snakes and squirrels. Past the first of Anatoni's five cabins, the trail disappears, so I follow the silver stream instead. Its rippled surface dotted with ice flows and leaping fish. The Yaga house has moved again. I point to the drawing of a house with chicken legs nestled in a pine thicket. Winter has been harsh this year, Anatoni nods gravely. The house got so cold, its knees splintered. It stood up in the middle of the night and the crack sounded like thunder. I heard it over 10 miles away. It ran south, its feet pounding along the riverbank until it warmed up and settled in this cosy thicket. The Yaga who lives in the house wasn't happy at all, as she doesn't like moving closer to the living. You know Yaga prefers dead souls. Dead souls and houses with chicken legs. Mamochi folds her arm over her chest and shakes her head. You fill her mind with nonsense, Anatoni. There's truth in all my stories, Anatoni said quietly. He glances up at me with a look of such sincerity that I want to tell him I believe every tale he's ever told. Instead, I rise to my feet and open the long wooden box on the mantelpiece. Inside is my favourite ink pen and my own copy of Anatoni's map. I drew it myself the last time he was here, and although it's not as neat as his, I'm proud of it. I roll it out on the table and carefully draw the house with chicken legs in its new position. Mamochi disappears into the kitchen, still muttering about nonsense. She only believes in things she can see for herself, but she wasn't always so dismissive of Anatoni's stories. When I was younger, she used to repeat them to me before bed in her matter-of-fact style, or she'd sing me the songs of her ancestors about the power of nature and the healing magic of the forest. But she seems to have decided that 12 years old is too old for stories. Last time Anatoni visited, after I went to bed, I heard Momochi tell him she worries about his stories keeping me wondering about my past. Anatoni told her I'm a magical bear child who will always wonder where I came from. Momochi replied, it would be better if my heart was in the village rather than getting lost in the stories of the forest. At that point, I turned over in bed, not wanting to hear any more, and I sang myself to sleep. I finished drawing the house with chicken legs and lean back over Anatoni's map to see what else is new. But my gaze lands on the blue mountain and I can't pull it away. Nestled high in a cliff is a sketch of the bear cave where I was found, with me as a baby, baby inked inside, snuggling into the arms of the bear, Tazana. Anatoni always referred to the bear who raised me as Tasarin, a queen of the snow forest. My feet ached with the same restless feeling I had earlier after I heard the bullfinch speak. Outside the snow glistens and an urge to make footprints in it swells inside me. The bear cave, Anatoni's voice cuts through me my thoughts. He gently touches the map right next to the cave. Where your mamocha found the most precious treasure ever discovered in the snow forest. Mamocha places a mug of spittin in front of me and drops a kiss into my head. She smiles at Anatoly and he smiles back without looking away. And for a moment, I feel like the three of us belong together, like a real family. How long are you staying? I blurt out, then regret the question, because Anatoly's face burns bright red all the way to his ears and he doesn't answer. Mamocha leans down and tops up the teapot with hot water from the samovar. Steam rises when she opens the tap in the shining brass urn, the heat in the air disguising Anatoni's brush blushing. What's that? she asks, pointing to a tiny tri tri triangular mark on the map. I peer at the triangle embedded high in the trunk of a tall, slim birch. Inside the triangle is the letter N with a crown on top. It's the new mark! 
Excitement rushes through me, washing away the twinge of disappointment I felt at not finding the mark myself. And it has something to do with the princess, Nastasia. I recognise the crown N as her symbol. Anatoly has told me stories about her before, and some of them have hinted that she might be my birth mother. The thought might be true, and that I might learn something about her gives me a sudden breathtaking thrill, like skidding slightly out of control on ice. Anatoly pulls an object wrapped in cloth from his pocket and passes it to me. It's as big as my palm, heavy and feels cold through the cloth. Mousetrap pokes his head out of his hole in the corner near the fire and sniffs the air. He's a fierce and proud hunter and never begs for food, unless it's freshwater cod brought by Anatoly. But it's not cod in the parcel. Inside is a triangular ice blue rock, smooth as glass with a tip and edges as sharp as a knife. Anatoly has made a hole in the wide end and threaded it with leather cord so it can be worn as a necklace. The rock trembles in my hand. It feels unnaturally cold, like there's a snowstorm inside it. The corners of Mousetrap's mouth turn down when he realises there's no fish on offer. But perhaps he catches the scent of the story to come, because he edges closer, scoots up the back of my chair, settles onto my shoulder and stares at Anatoly expectantly. I breathe in Mousetrap's familiar smell of dust and earthy musk and reach up to give him a stroke but he pushes my finger away. Mousetrap loves sitting on my shoulder, but he doesn't like being fussed or petted. Is this an arrowhead? I ask, holding the rock up to the window so it shimmers with starlight. Anatoly nods. It's for you. The Princess Nastea's last arrow. His voice cracks a little and he takes another swig of tea. It's beautiful, thank you. I lift the necklace over my head, being careful not to disturb Mousetrap, then turn to show Momocha. It looks lovely on you, Momocha smiles, but with those sharp edges, it doesn't seem very safe to wear. She raises her eyebrows at Anatoly and he looks down apologetically. Would you like to hear the arrow story? Anatoly asks. Yes, please. Goosebumps shiver over my skin. Although I've heard stories about the Princess Nastea before, I've not heard one about an arrow. Mousetrap lets out a squeaky yawn, stretches and curls around my neck. Princesses and arrowheads. Mamocha tucks as she returns to the kitchen where she makes a show of putting away the fish and game Anatola has brought us. But I see her through the doorway, listening. Mamocha might not believe Anatola's story, but she's not immune to their magic. Perhaps Anatola's stories are too fantastic to be true but wrapped up in one of his tails with the fire crackling on the hearth and ice glistening on the windows, I can believe that one day I'll find my own story and it will shine as brilliantly as a clear night sky. I'm just going to pause there, sharks and toucans, um, because the very first, one of the questions that we're going to answer in a moment is about why, Anast why um, Yanka is saying that about I believe one day I'll find my own story so keep that in your heads we're not going to pause just yet but keep that in your head because that's a really important quote okay there is truth in my stories Anatoly whispers as he passes me a prianic I smile and I take a bite of the soft cookie then Anatoly begins as he always does with once upon a time the princess Nastea's last arrow once upon a time, a great warrior came to the snow forest. Her name was the Princess Nastea. She carried a bow over her shoulder and a quiver of arrows on her back, and with them she could shoot the twinkle from a star. For many years, the Princess Nastea defended and protected the creatures of the snow forest. She drove the water demons from the river, calmed the wood spirits, with how whose howls brought rain, and saved the souls of the giant deathless. Then one day she met a fisherman on the shores of the Green Bay. They fell in love and had a beautiful daughter. But before the baby was one moon old, the fiery volcano in the north exploded into flames. Smee, a three-headed fire dragon, erupted into the sky, and Astea's husband, who was near the volcano at the time, became trapped by the furious beast. Nastea burned with rage. She shouldered her bow, 
held her baby to her breast and climbed to a cave in the Blue Mountain. There, though it broke her heart to do so, she left her beloved daughter in the care of the only creature she trusted to keep her safe, the bear Tazaria. And at the very top of the mountain, where the ancient peak is stained blue by the sky, Nastea carved six, uh, six arrowheads. Made from thick blue ice and hardened with stardust, they were strong and cold enough to cool the anger in a fire dragon's heart. The sun set and the moon rose three times before Nastea reached the fiery volcano and found Smay's cavern. Nastasia charged in and aimed an arrow at the dragon's heart, but Smay held her husband too close for her to take the shot. Between two heartbeats, Nastasia fired five arrows at Smay's three heads, blinding five of his eyes. Nastasia smiled and drew back her final arrow to blind the dragon's last eye. But Smay opened his great wings and flew from the cavern, still holding Nastasia's husband. Then Smay roared with anger and dropped him into a swirl of dragon fire. Grief tore through Nastasia as she watched her husband disappear into the flames. Her chest crumpled and she struggled to breathe. She released her last arrow, and, but it missed the target. The arrow clipped Smay's wing, make him, making him tumble through the sky, and spitting fiery bombs and cinders, he collapsed upon her. There was no escape. High above, the last arrow flew on. It sailed over stars, carrying Nastasia's love and strength. It dipped under the moon, picking up moonbeams and magic, and it landed deep in the bark of a tall, slim birch. Tears pulled in Nastasia's eyes, which shone with thoughts of her orphan child. But her final breath was filled with hope that one day her daughter would find the last arrow and then her story would be remembered. Wow, that's quite powerful, isn't it? Quite a powerful chapter. A uh, beautiful story, beautiful description as well, using lots of adjectives um, and imagery as well. Now, if you could open the Google Doc, please, there are a few some questions that I would like you to answer. And I've added sentence stems as well, so we can begin how we would in class. So the first question I'd like you to use is what do we know so far about Yanka? So think about all the evidence we've collected in chapter one and chapter two. And I would like you to use evidence from the text, remembering to use inverted commas, please, whenever you take anything from the text. And I'd like you to begin it with your sentence stem of from reading the text so far, comma, we know that Yanka is. So you tell me what we know about Yanka so far. What kind of person is she? What of her what of her traits? What character traits does she have? OK, so think about that. Maybe some of our um, learning tools, maybe perseverance, resilience, etc. Um, we could use um, some of our pride code, maybe politeness, respect, etc. Is she independent? You know, think about all those character, those traits that we have as people. And the next question um, is, why does Yanka believe she will find her own story? So it's that quotation that we got from the earlier in the text. And I would like you to use PEE, -E, please, to do to answer this question. So point, and I've added the sentence stem, in my opinion, evidence. I know this because it says in the text, using inverted commas, and explain, this tells me that. You tell me what that, that evidence actually tells us, okay, about Yanka as a person. So please take your time to do this. I want quality, please. So don't just rush it. I actually want quality tech, quality work from you. If you want to color code the point evidence um, explain, then you can, okay, like we would in class. Can you please also make sure that your Kindles get charged up because it's really important. Obviously you can use this um, and you can flick back and pause it, et cetera, on different parts of the text that you need. And you've still got the one from yesterday as well that you can use whenever we do any of the reading, you'll always have the previous one. So you can use the text there as well. Okay. I would just like to say, um, I hope that you are enjoying your learning. Um, and obviously if you have any questions, add it to the thread. Okay. Thank you very, very much. I'm just going to stop share and I will hopefully ask you tomorrow. Bye.